All right, so y'all take your Bibles tonight and uh, flip to 2 Kings chapter 3. We're going to be in uh, verse 15 through 19, as I had been done said. And uh, it's going to be up on the screens. We're going to read a uh, passage tonight, and then I want to kind of paraphrase to you what's going on here, because we're going to read this and you're going to go, what in the world is happening here? And I'm just going to go ahead and tell you now, I'm so glad you asked. I know you haven't asked yet, but I'm just trusting the Lord that you're going to ask. Uh, and so thank you for asking in the future. Uh, but we're going to read this passage, and then I'm going to paraphrase this for you guys a little bit. So 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 15 through 19, if y'all would uh, read with me. So this is the prophet Elisha speaking, and he says, Now bring me a musician, and you'll see why in a little bit. While the musician played, the Lord's hand came on Elisha. Then he said, this is what the Lord says. Dig ditch after ditch in this valley. For the Lord says, you will not see wind or rain, but the valley will be filled with water and you will drink, you and your cattle and your animals. This is easy in the Lord's sight. He will also hand Moab over to you. Then you must attack every fortified city and every choice city. You must cut down every good tree and stop up every spring of water. You must ruin every good piece of land. So Father, we just pray tonight as we have opened your word and as we begin to read it, God, that it would come alive to us thousands of years later as these events transpired. Lord, that uh, your, your universal and timeless truth in your word, God, that it would just be clear, be evident, be abundant in our minds tonight and in our hearts. And I pray, Lord, for anyone who may be struggling in this room and may need this very message, Lord, that uh, you would speak your strength to them, that you would just uh, give your spirit, give comfort, so we love you, Lord, and send Jesus name. So basically, what's going on here? We read this passage and it's like, okay, what is happening here? Something about water and drinking water and animals and destroying things, right? So what in the blazes is happening? And again, I'm so glad you guys were going to ask because I knew you were going to ask. Well, what's happening? And that's why. Yeah, thanks. So. You even did ask. That's Luke is setting y'all up, man. Y'all y'all like, oh. Luke, Luke, Luke asked for you guys. It's good stuff. So basically what's going on is uh, in, in the kingdom of Israel at this point. So uh, I don't know how much you know about biblical history in the Old Testament, but basically uh, there was a time in the Old Testament where the kingdom of Israel split. All right? And so you had ten tribes, the northern, I mean, I'm sorry, not ten. You had the northern tribes, ten tribes, which was Israel. And then you had the southern tribes, which was Judah. Everybody got that? Does that make sense? Everybody say, yeah. Israel. 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 So I'll be like, I'll be like, not us fake. And you say, Israel. 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 Right? Israel. Israel. Okay, that was my <laughs> joke. I won't quit my day job. Don't worry. And, uh, and so then you have the southern tribes of Judah. Okay? okay. So what happens at this point is uh, the, the king uh, Ahab, who is king over Israel, he has passed away. He has died. He dead. He gone. Okay? He in the ground. is done. Nothing more to say about that. Okay, he's gone. So his son, this guy named Joram. Everybody say Joram. Joram. Or you can say Joram. Or you can say Joram. like Joram. Um, however you want to pronounce it. You can Joram, crazy. <laughs> yes, yes. That's what I'm saying. Gotcha. <laughs> So this guy named Joram, he becomes king over Israel. And so uh, here's what happens. Um, the king over this land called Moab, this king, uh, had been paying the, the king of Israel, which was Ahab, had been paying this king 100,000 lambs and 100,000 rams. That's a lot. That's, that's a lot of rams. And a lot of rams. You could you could make like, yeah, I mean, I don't know. You could, you could, you could make some kind of song about that with some rap. Um, which I actually wrote a rap just for you guys tonight that oh, talks about a hundred thousand. No, I'm just That's kidding. I, I did not. I did not write a rap for you. Um, I thought you were all going to leave. So, uh, but I will write one in the future for you. So, anyways, this king of Moab, he's been giving a hundred thousand rams and a hundred thousand lambs. Now, I don't know if like the Israelites were just like really hungry people. Yeah, and, and they were having like a barbecue like every day for the entire nation. I'm not sure what's going on there, yeah. But uh, but we what we do know is that the king of Moab probably sacrifices, yeah, something along those lines. Uh, but we don't fully know. What we do know is that this king had been uh, in this commitment with Israel for whatever reason. We're not going to get into all that tonight because that's not the point of where we're going. So what happens is King Ahab is what? Dead. He dead. He gone, he dead. right? Yeah. 
So his son Joram uh, becomes king. And what happens at this point is the king of Moab is like, hey, well, forget you guys, man. I, I was committed to this guy, but I'm not worried about doing this anymore. And so he stops his payment of like a thousand, hundred million livestock that really nobody should ever need for anything. Uh, but what, for whatever reason, he stops uh, giving this uh, to the new king, King Joram. And so King Joram gets together with his buddy Jehoshaphat. I know y'all heard that word. That's like my favorite name in the Bible. Like, just been Jehoshaphat! Like, that's just, that's exciting for me to say. I, I can't, I can't say that boring. Like, so the rest of this, if you hear me say it boring, I'm trying really hard. Like, I can't, I, I, I just can't. Like, yeah, Jehoshaphat! Like, I, I, no matter what, no matter what I do, I can't, I can't say it all. Because Jehoshaphat is the king over Judah. And which tribes was Judah? Two tribes. Uh, the southern ones, right? Yeah, the southern tribes, yes. And so uh, the two of them get together, and King Joram says, Hey, listen, uh, these guys owe me money. Where my money at, yo? And uh, so Jehoshaphat's like, Man, I got you, bro. Let, let's go, let's go. I got you back. Um, that was my extremely poor attempt at being good. Um, and so what happens is they get all their buddies, and, and uh, they, they decide, Hey, we're going to go to this king of Moab, and we're going to get him to pay us what he owes us, right? And so on the way through, they go through a land called Edom. And just real quick, they go through Edom, and while they're on the way, they gather the boy, uh, the king of Edom. They're like, hey man, come on, let's go. And so he's like, all right, I got you, man. So, so they form a little group, and so they've got an army at this point, and they're traveling to the land of Moab. All right, everybody got that? So the king of Israel, the king of Judah, and the king of Edom are all three with armies traveling to the land of Moab. There's not going to be a test, so you don't have to remember all these things. Uh -oh. You're so welcome. Uh -oh. uh, but they're going to do some business. Right, Lenny's like, uh-oh, yeah, like this is serious junk. They're going to do some business. So they're going out, they're traveling, and here's where it gets fun. You ready? They've been traveling for seven days at this point. So about a week. What is the longest you guys have ever been in a car? 12 hours. 12 hours? Anybody? Can anybody 20. beat 12 hours? Uh, 20? Can anybody beat 20 hours? I don't know. Yeah. How long, Mom? I don't know. Oh, wait. I got this. Oh, one. Two hours. weeks. Non stop? Whoa. Yeah, whoa, in a truck. Hold on. Hold on. Oh, yeah. Hey, oh, hey, <laughs> wow, yeah, because your dad's a truck driver. Two weeks. Yeah. Can it's anybody beat two truck? weeks? Like, non stop. Whoa. Like, does this truck have. Cool? Yeah. Is that Dude, say what? In the truck. The car ride of life. Okay, it was the car ride of life. <laughs> 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 All right, so uh, second question. What is the longest you guys have ever walked, run, or ran? Without, like, <laughs> taking a nap and, like, going to eat. You know, like, like you were running or you were walking. One mile. There and back. Nice. And how long is that? It's I like have no idea. I think about, like, five to six miles. Six miles? Six that's miles. what I was thinking. That's impressive. One way. I had to with my mom. One time. No, I'm I'm all, all right, all right, let's bring it back in, let's bring it back in. This, this is supposed to be like organized chaos where y'all like, you can like say stuff, but you got to wave the hand and say stuff. Can anybody beat six miles? Anybody gone further than six miles, walked or ran? I can probably have that. I'd probably have that. <laughs> Probably, but I don't know. Don't count. Actually, So that's a long way to go. All right, y'all feeling me? And Lenny, were you tired when you got done doing that? I was tired. Oh, you I was up and I was sore. Right? Yeah, you're sore and you're worn out. You're hungry. Yeah, I got like you still have this little mom to deal with me when I'm younger. Right? Yeah. So you kind of you kind of get used to it a little bit. Yeah, yeah. But but you get tired, man. After you do that, um, you know, if you've got if you've done a marathon or you've done any kind of run, I used to do cross country when I was in high school, um, and it was great, man. I was I was the top runner. It was awesome. Like, that was my glory days. I was in high school. I was, I was yeah. like, the, the biggest athlete, man. I was, like, so shred, and, and it was great. I was the best cross-country runner. But no, that's not true. I was a total nerd, and nobody liked me, and I had long, greasy hair, and I was actually the third worst cross-country runner on the team. Uh, but I used to run with these guys, man, and, and it was crazy because I, I had never done distance running before. I'd, I'd, I'd done distance walking, or what I call distance walking, which is like from my bedroom to the refrigerator to get some pizza. Um, but I started running with these guys, and I found out real quick, dude, these, these guys ain't playing no joke. Yeah, and I was like, why, why do you do this to yourself? Like, you guys are fit, you know, you, why? There's, it's not fun. It's just not fun. Like, I would rather be at home playing Super Nintendo. Y'all probably don't even know what that is. I do. Uh, I'd rather be at home, like, playing some video games, you know, and you guys are out here, like, <laughs> trying to, like, 
like move faster than this guy over here and there's no prize for it. Who gives a crap? You know, like what in the world is going on? And, and so anyways, uh, but I used to do it with, with these guys and it was just terrible, man. It was horrible. I was so tired all the time. I'd get home and I'd be like, how'd it go? I'd be like, it's terrible. They made me put one foot after another really fast over and over again for a minute. Mama, you gotta come here, baby. You're still okay. I'm a mama's boy at heart. Uh, Y'all supposed to say, aww, which I missed your cue or something. Aww. Uh, anyways, that's, that may or may not be how that worked out. Uh, so, man, it's, it's hard walking, running, any kind of long distance thing. It's tough. And so I want you to imagine, here are these armies of these three kings, lots of people, right? And they are traveling for seven days. I'm not talking like, hey, man, let's go, Mom, then let's stop and play some Donkey Kong. Like, no, it's, it's like... We're, we're going, no pizza, no nothing, no carb overload, whatever that even means. They were just going. And you got to keep in mind, they had weapons. They were ready to fight. So they had gear, they're carrying stuff with them. They had all, yeah, I mean, it, it's crazy. And they're going for seven days, most of the day traveling. Again, not just like taking and going a little bit and then taking a break. I mean, they're going hard at it. And so on the seventh day, these guys all run out of water. Oh, no. Oh, now, mind you. They have not got to their destination yet, which means they are also seven days from getting back home if they decide, hey, uh, whoever was in charge of Planet of the Water, you're fired. Uh, we're going back home to get some more. They couldn't do that. Seven days away, a whole week of nonstop walking without water. I mean, intense. And here they are about to fight a battle, y'all with me? They're about to go to war, and there's no water, not only for the people, but even for their animals. So y'all feeling me like you're pretty tired, oh, no. pretty thirsty, and like no Gatorade back then, so you couldn't just be like, I didn't try, like you know, like there, there was none of that stuff. I mean, they had nothing, so they're tired, and so here's what happens. Uh, the king of Joram was like, oh crap, uh, we're going to die. And, and so he says, has the Lord brought all three of us kings together so that we will sit out here in this desert and die and be overtaken by our enemies. And so he looks, uh, somebody comes up to him and they say, hey, there's this prophet named Elisha. Everybody remember Elisha? Yeah. yeah. Now he, he said, Elisha used to do this stuff for Elijah, who was, you know, another great prophet back then. And so they go and they seek Elisha. Elisha's a little ticked off about it. And uh, um, we're going to look at something in a little bit, so I don't want to spoil it for you. But he's not a huge fan of uh, King Joram. And so uh, he, he kind of gets a little smart like with him. It's kind of funny because he's talking to the king and he's like, Man, if it wasn't for King Jehoshaphat, I'd have nothing to do with you right here. What do you want? And I'm like, oh boy, you're saying I'm okay. King Black Slice, go head off. And that's it. Uh, but he's a pretty brave guy. And, and so he let him know, man, I've got no respect for you. What do you want here? And, and so um, I'll tell you in just a little bit. And so the king replies, uh, man, the Lord has summoned us here. The Lord summoned us three kings here, and now he's going to hand us over to Moab. And so Elisha responds. And basically, this is what he does. So this is this is where we were at when we picked up in this passage. And so he says, bring me a musician, which is cool to me. Because it's like, you know, Elisha was like, hey, the Lord's going to speak to me, but i got to have some music. So, you know, if you ever talk to like some of those people at church that are like, we don't need music. Music is something different. We don't need music. I mean, Elisha used it. He was like a pretty cool prophet of God. And like when he wanted to hear from the Lord, he got somebody to come play guitar. I mean, I'm just like, that's cool. Y'all can cheer later. That's all good. Whatever. Uh, but anyways, so they seek the help of Elisha. And so Elisha starts to speak to the Lord. And this is what the Lord does. This is what the Lord says. And I, I'm going to read for you again. And then we're going to get to the good stuff in this. So when the musician played, the Lord's hand came on Elisha. Then he said, this is what the Lord says. Now, you know the backstory at this point. So you know how these guys are feeling. Dig ditch after ditch in this valley. For the Lord says, you will not see wind or rain, but the valley will be filled with water, and you will drink, you and your cattle and your animals. This is easy in the Lord's sight. He will also hand over Moab to you. The evil plan. So, before we carry on, this is a strange message that the people hear from God. Y'all with me? They have just walked seven days, are tired. I'm sorry, this mic's not working. I'm going to take it off in a second. They walk seven days, and they're tired, and they're thirsty. And they go before God. And what does God tell them to do? Dig ditches. Dig, 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 dig ditches. Dig ditch after ditch after ditch. I have a question. Now, I don't know... 
if you guys are with me here, but if I have just walked for seven days and I have run out of water and I'm tired and I'm thirsty and I'm hungry and I'm certainly in no capability to fight an entire army right now and I hear a word from the Lord that says I want you to pick up a shovel, which they didn't, probably didn't even have shovels, I want you to dig ditches. Get down on your hands and knees and pull dirt out of the ground and make ditches. Lord, I don't know if you, you heard us. We're thirsty. <laughs> We're tired. No, I know. I want you to dig ditches. Okay? How long so before we get on to the next thing, it's important, I, I want to talk about this a little bit, but it's important for us to talk about discerning God's voice tonight. Before we get on to the, the, kind of the bigger stuff, if y'all can hold your comments and questions uh, from now to the end, that would be awesome. So, discerning God's voice. You guys know, and you've heard people say this, God speaks in many ways, right? You've probably heard the phrase, the Lord speaks in mysterious ways, right? Have I ever heard somebody say that? You've probably seen it in a movie. Uh, God speaks in many ways. You guys remember Elijah? We talked about him a number of months back where um, Elijah was, was running for his life, right? And he's hiding in this cave. And, and God says, hey, I want you to go out of this cave and I want you to stand at the top of this mountain. I'm going to come talk to you. I'm going to pass by. And so you remember, the Lord comes by and there's this great wind. There's this hurricane. There's this huge storm. Uh, there's this great fire that comes and tornado. I mean, there's all this crazy, loud, incredibly powerful stuff that comes. And then how does God speak? Do you remember? In a whisper. He speaks in a whisper. He speaks in a whisper. And in the Old Testament, uh, we've talked a lot about the prophets that God spoke through, but, but back then He would speak through prophets. That's why they were looking for Elisha, because He would speak through uh, a lot of these prophets in the Old Testament. Now, here's something interesting. King Joram, the king, we're talking about king over Israel, he had to go to a prophet to hear from God. Why do you think that is? Verse 2, we didn't read it, but verse 2 in 2 Kings chapter 3 talks about King Joram. Verse 2, and he says this. I'm talking about King Joram. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight, but not like his father and mother, because he removed the sacred pillar of Baal his father had made. So he did some good. This was a king who had followed a series of wicked kings, which was why the nation of Israel had been split. Okay? But he did some good things, but it still says in verse 2, overall, he was a wicked king. So we say, well, wait a minute, why did he have to go to a prophet to hear God? Because David, I mean, David heard from God himself a few times, you know? I mean, Solomon had this cool meeting with God. So why, why did King Joram have to go to a prophet to hear from God? Well, he was wicked in the Lord's sight. And I'm going to say something to you guys tonight. I want you to hear this. Wickedness in the heart deafens the ears of the soul. Y'all, sin, sin is like a wall. It's, it's, it's like a wall. It's like when you sin, when you sin, it, it starts building up this wall between you and God. Have you ever heard somebody maybe talk about it that way or anything before? But when you sin, it, it's not that your relationship is broken with God. It's not that you're no longer His because you sin, because we all know that Christian sin, can I get a witness? Who has sinned today? Oh, I, I thought I was in a holy place. I got to leave y'all. Y'all, y'all, y'all bad people. Y'all bad, terrible people. No, no, I mean, we all know that, man. When we get saved, it doesn't make us stop sinning. But we know that when we do sin, it's like we're building up a wall between us and God, and there's no communication between us and Him. There's no fellowship between us and Him. He may be trying to speak to us or say something, but we can't discern His voice. We can't hear Him. Because of this wall. Does that make sense? Yes. I'm confused. Rock concert. Okay, yeah. So, the uh, Lord speaks in many ways. Um, but he, he speaks through the Spirit today. He used to speak through the prophets in the Old Testament. We talked about that months ago, but I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on that. Um, but here's the second point of that. God often tells us things, you guys, that we don't want to hear. I hear what I just said. God often tells us things, if we really want to hear from Him, things that we don't really want to hear, or things that maybe we wouldn't expect to hear. Why is that so important for us to say that tonight? You guys, so many people, listen to me, listen to me, so many people relate God's voice to feelings that they have. 
So many people say, well, man, I feel great about this. The Lord must be calling me to do this. Well, guess what? The Lord doesn't always call you to do things that make you feel great. In fact, if it's making you comfortable, it might not be the Lord calling you to do that. <laughs> Maybe it is, but it might not be. We have this, I talked to you last year about it, this Disney theology, right? Uh, where it's like, you know, everything's supposed to work out for us. It's all about us. Life is supposed to be great and perfect and peachy. And God exists to meet our every need rather than we exist to glorify Him and serve His purpose and His plan. Uh, but, but so many times we have this idea in our minds and in our hearts of what we want to do or what we think that God should enable us to do or God should do for us. Amen? That's why we pray sometimes when we say, okay, Lord, this is going on. I don't think it should be going on, so I'm asking you to please not let it be going on. Or if we have a more spiritually mature prayer where we understand, we say, okay, God, this is going on in my life. I understand and know that you have a purpose for it. Help me understand that purpose and help me seek you in the midst of it. And if it pleases you, please help this problem or fix this issue or heal this person or help me out. Y'all feel what I'm saying? But so many times we go to God and we want Him to tell us what we want Him to tell us. Y'all with me? Did I lose everybody? You know how I know that? Because sometimes God gives us the answer as clear as day. And it's not good enough. It's not what we want. So sometimes we'll just keep going back and say, okay, Lord, I don't know if you're hearing me. I don't know. I asked you about this. And when God's like, I know I heard you, I said, no, not right now. And you're, I mean, could you imagine, like, we're like the worst kids sometimes. Like, hey, Dad, hey, Dad, will you do this for me? Not right now, son. Hey, Dad, I don't know if you hear me. Will you do this for me? I, I said, not right now, son. Go ask your mom. Hey, Dad, hey, Dad. Yeah, right. Mom said I could. You know, I mean, like, sometimes God gives us a clear answer, but it's not good enough for us. And so, anyways, we, we keep, but that's not the point. I'm just, that's a little rabbit trail that I'm, I don't need to get on. But our, our natural inclination is to satisfy our flesh, meaning that God will lead us to do things, listen, that are unnatural and uncomfortable. Did I hear what I just said? Oh, come on, did y'all hear what I just said? Our natural tendency and desire is to do what we want to do. To satisfy our flesh, to be selfish, to be comfortable, to be secure. Our natural tendency is to sin. And so if God calls us to do something, a lot of times it's going to be uncomfortable, it's going to be something uh, that's unnatural. Y'all feeling me? Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8 through 9. You got that up there, CJ? Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8 through, 8 through 9. You got that up there? Can you hear me? Yeah. It should be right there. Alright, well, I'll just read it to you guys. Isaiah chapter 59, verse 8 through 9 says this, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and your ways are not my ways. This is the Lord's declaration. For as heaven is higher than earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. So, we tend to try to put God on the spectrum that we're here and God is right here with us. So, He needs to do things that we understand. He needs to talk in a way that we can grasp and, and that we can be happy with and we can be pleased with. But man, to be honest, it's not how God operates. Here's what I mean by that. There's a guy in the Old Testament by the name of Jose. He's a prophet. I think I've told you about him a little bit. And so what happens is God tells Hosea, here's what I want you to do, Hosea. I want you to go, as a prophet, as a man of God, I want you to go and marry a prostitute. I'm, I'm sorry, Lord. I, I could have sworn I just heard you tell me to go marry a prostitute. That's, that's what I said, Hosea. Yeah. Why? Doesn't ask. Doesn't, doesn't throw a fit. You got it, Lord. Whatever you're doing here, okay? And so Hosea is faithful, and he goes and he marries this prostitute. Well, guess what happens? The prostitute, her name is Gomer. She cheats on him time and time again. She has kids with other people. And this is what God says. Hosea, I want you to go and buy back your wife. Buy. Buy her back. And I want you to show your love to her. You got it, Lord. So Hosea goes and does it. I'm going to be honest with you guys. I don't know if you've ever been cheated on. <laughs> but I was in little dating relationships and stuff. And it hurts. It hurts. I've never experienced that in a marriage. 
I can't imagine what this guy was going through, but he is faithful to do what God does, and God's message to Israel was, look at this, this is what you have done to me. You have cheated on me, you have been unfaithful to me, you have sinned, you have turned to false gods, but this is what I have done for you, I will buy you back at a price. And it's an amazing thing. But he tells Hosea to do this crazy thing. Uh, Isaiah, not Hosea, Isaiah. Y'all know Isaiah? I mean, my man Isaiah. Isaiah is a prophet of God in the Old Testament as well. God tells Isaiah, and I'll get this, this is crazy, and I, I would suggest not doing this. Um, God tells Isaiah to spend a long amount of time without any amount of clothing. <laughs> and to actually go and preach without wearing any clothing. <laughs> now, Nothing. I've never seen a pastor do that. Things. I've never seen a man of God get up in front of a congregation with no clothes and say, the Lord told me not to wear clothes and preach to you. So I cannot imagine what that would be like. But I can imagine in this church, if Joe did that, uh, we would quickly send him home and probably get him some help. Uh, so, uh, But this is what happens, and Isaiah says, this is crazy, okay, you got it, and God had a purpose for it. Uh, Joshua, you remember Joshua? Way back in the day, right? Most Marches time. around the city of Jericho. Guess what God tells them? I want you to go. I want you to take your army, and I want you to walk around this city and blow trumpets. <laughs> For seven, seven times. times. Uh, but For Lord, seven, seven, seven. this is the promised land you promised us. Wouldn't it just be better, easier, you know, simpler if we just went in and took everybody out? This is what I want you to do, Joshua. I want you to take Israel, and I want you to march around this entire city and blow trumpets. And on this time, at this day, if you've done what I've said to do, you'll see me deliver you. Walls are going to fall down. Well, guess what happened? Walls fall down. Well, could you imagine being Joshua? You want us to go in this city where they have guards, and they're probably going to throw things at us or try to kill us, and walk around. And not, only, not even be sneaky like, come on, come on, he's real. But be like, you know, like playing like the number one in the billboard charts, you know, as loud as you could, like Hillsong Worship, you know, they were just blasting it, you know, as they're walking. I mean, like, it's a crazy thing. Uh, and, and here we see the same thing in 2 Kings chapter 3 here. God calls three armies who are thirsty and tired and worn out, and He says, I want you to dig ditches. So are you feeling me when I say that God often tells us to do things that we don't want to hear and also things that do not make sense to us? And let me tell you something tonight. God may be calling you to do strange things. God may be calling you to do strange things. It's strange to live like Jesus in a culture that wants nothing to do with Him. It's strange to go to your lost friends and say, Hey man, do you know Jesus? Because i, I got to tell you, man, like... I, I care about you and, and I worry about you because I don't want you spending your life, you know, not in the fullest way. I don't want you spending your life without true peace and without joy. I'm worried about your eternity. I care about you that much. That's strange. It's strange to not listen to the same music that everybody else in the world is listening to because it's filthy and full of garbage and what you pour in will pour out. It's strange not to watch the same TV shows or the same movies or go to the same places. It's strange to be different and listen God may be calling you in fact if you're a Christian he is calling you to do strange things if you hear me say amen. amen now here's where I want to really get into this with the last few minutes that we have left tonight obeying God's commands we see this here we see this a lot of times throughout scripture when God calls us to do stuff the next most important thing Besides how we hear our listening, making sure that we do hear them, the next important thing is what we do with it, right? right? As if we hear the Lord's voice and we're like, oh, cool, God spoke to me. And then we're like, okay, I'm going to go back to playing games now. You know, like then what's the point, right? So we want to be faithful in how we respond. And I'm going to tell you guys, obeying God's commands calls for patience. Number one, calls for patience. God calls you to do something, which he calls us all to do things. Calls us to make disciples. Calls us to take the gospel into the world. Calls us to follow Him and to know Him. Mm -hmm. Y'all with me? Mm -hmm. That, walking with Christ, takes patience. It calls for patience. I think about Abraham. When God said, I'm going to make you into a great nation, and we've talked about Him. And guess what? Abraham never saw that. In fact, we wouldn't see that promise fulfilled that was made to Abraham until when? David. Oh, 
y'all know this. No? Isaac. No? No. Jesus. Jesus, right? And said, so I'm going to make you in a great nation, which was Israel, and through you I'm going to bless all nations, which was Jesus. That's a long time to wait. A couple thousand years, give or take. That's, that's a long time to wait, right? Y'all <laughs> yeah. feeling me? Uh, God calls Moses... And he says, I want you to take my people, rescue them out of Egypt, rescue them out of slavery. Now I want you to march for how many years? 40 years in the desert wilderness. Because they disobeyed. Because they disobeyed. And he got It's a long time. Y'all feel me? Obeying God's commands calls for patience. I don't know about you, I'm not a very patient person. And our entire culture today is all about getting things done now. Put that down, please, sir. It's all about getting things the way we want it and getting it done now. Y'all with me? Like Burger King. Like Burger King. Have it your way. That's right. Any kind of fast food thing. I mean, it's hard for us to be patient. We don't know how to be patient. And guess what? If something is taking longer than we want it to take, we get a little fidgety and then we get kind of mean. And then we want to, I want to talk to somebody about this. I, this is just ticking me off. This is making me it's so like mad. You get Obeying God's commands demands that you have patience. So listen, if you're not a very patient person, I'm going to encourage you, learn how to get patient. Learn how to wait in the Lord. Otherwise, it's going to be really tough living for Him sometimes. Obeying God's commands calls for courage. Living for Christ calls for courage. I mean, Joshua, he goes and he marches around this city. And again, I mean, I'm telling you guys, like, you've got to have some guts to do that. They've all got weapons up there. All they have to do is say, okay, that's Israel. Uh, I'm not too thrilled about them marching around our city. I don't know what they're planning, but we're going to do something about this. And all they have to do is start shooting arrows at them. Y'all with me? I mean, like, that's, yeah. So, they're walking around this thing blowing trumpets while these people have weapons. That takes courage to trust the Lord that He's going to show up and to follow Him with that. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, man, you guys remember all those guys, I'm sure, from, like, back when you were kids, especially if you ever watched VeggieTales. Uh, but, but, you know, I'm talking about, like, like, the whole nation was supposed to worship this king and worship this idol that the king had made, rather. And, and, and these guys said, no, we refuse to worship because we belong to the Lord and we will follow Him. And this king said, if you don't worship, you will be thrown into this fire and you will perish. And they said, so be it. We would rather die as godly men than bow before this and forsake our Lord and live the rest of our lives in shame and in fear. And broken fellowship of God it takes courage. Elijah, prophet of God, running from his life. Because this evil woman came to power and was trying to kill him. I mean, actively pursuing him. David, you remember David? Same thing. Both of these guys are hanging out in caves at different points, running for their lives because they are faithful to say the things that God has told them to say, to give the messages that God has called them to give to people. And I mean, it's, it's, it's incredibly difficult stuff to do, and it takes courage. And oftentimes, if you follow the Lord and you obey His commands, it will be you against the world. That's right. And that can be lonely, and that can be scary. So following God's commands takes courage. I'm going to ask you something. Fellas, are you man enough? No, probably not. Are you man enough to obey God's commands even when it costs you, ladies? Are you woman enough? Are you faithful enough to obey God's commands when it costs you? When it costs you friends, when it costs you reputation? So Obeying God's commands calls for faith. Same thing with Moses, man, wandering in this wilderness with these unfaithful, fickle people for 40 years. All these Old Testament prophets who knew if they gave these messages from God to these people that they would be persecuted or they would be killed. Yeah. It takes faith to trust in the Lord. And lastly, obeying God's commands calls for faithfulness. And this is what I want to spend the last bit of our time on. And if you guys zoned out, please jump back in because this is good stuff. Obeying God's commands calls for faithfulness. These people are here, close to their destination. And you guys, they're tired. I told you they're tired and they're thirsty. And they can't go on much longer. They're worn out. God says, I've got work for you to do. He says, 
says, I want you to dig those ditches. And what do they do? They dig ditches. And here's what happens. You ready? You ready? Yeah. We're waiting. Yeah. Here's what happens. Waiting. These people, these armies, tired, worn out, blisters on their fingers, thirsty, in the desert land, start digging ditches. And overnight, these ditches fill up with water, just like the Lord said they would. And here's what happens next. The armies of Moab heard that these armies were coming to attack them, and they said, hey, let's go out and meet them, and let's take them out. And get this, this army of Moab goes out, and when they see the ditches, for whatever reason, Scripture says, it looked like pools of blood. The way the sun was shining on it, I don't know, but it looked like blood. And these people, this army of Moab, got so terrified when they saw this that they started killing each other and took off running. And at that point, God had the victory. These armies had the victory. And these people moved in from point A to point B. And guess what? They accomplished what they set out to accomplish. And God was victorious. And His people were victorious over a crazy thing. Guess what? God could have sent rain. And it could have rained and filled these people up with water. And then they could have gone out and they could have had the victory. But guess what? It would have been their victory by their hands at that point. Instead, He says, I want you to do something crazy that will not make sense. Here's why. Because I will get the glory. If you do this, your way, you can claim that you did it. And guess what? You cannot do it. It is me working through you. It is me empowering you. And I want to show you that I can do absolutely anything. And he says right there, this is easy for the Amen. Lord to do. And that's exactly what happens. And these people are so terrified, they start killing each other and they run off. But here's the tricky part, you guys. If you want to see God's miraculous power in your life, you've got to be faithful. Listen to me tired when you're worn out listen when you have prayed the same prayers over and over God deliver me from this God where are you why don't you show up I'm tired I'm worn out I'm sick of this going on you gonna keep digging ditches or are you gonna throw in the towel because listen, if you want to see the Lord work, it's going to take some work on your own part. Mm. And what I mean by that is it's going to take faithfulness. And there will be times, you guys, in life when you will be so worn out, so dead, so burnt out in your spirit, so frustrated with people, so frustrated with jobs, so frustrated with churches, so frustrated with leaders, with family, with friends. You will be so worn out and so frustrated that you will want to throw in the towel and say, I've had enough. And it's at that point when you feel like you can't go anymore. And the Lord says, no, I got something for you. Keep pressing on. Amen. We spend our lives walking through deserts and walking through valleys. And we, we, we have mountaintops that we're on figuratively and, and we have valleys that we're in. And the thing about being in deserts, the thing about being in valleys is that for whatever reason in our life, we can't see where the end of them is. We just know we're in the desert. Y'all with me? We just know we're in the valley. We're in the difficult time and we can't always see when it's going to be over. But here's the thing. If you cop out, in your Christian walk, or just in your life in general, if you cop out before you get through it, before you get through the desert, guess what? You can't see where the end of it is. You could have been right there. And it could have taken one more step and you would have been over. We never know. So all we can do, man, is by the strength that God gives us to keep pressing on. And lastly, I want to tell you this tonight. Failing does not make you a failure. You're wondering, okay, Johnny, where in the world do you get that from? Listen, when you dig ditches, it's hard. Sometimes it's backbreaking work. Sometimes you feel like you can't go on. Your hands are calloused. You're tired. You're worn out. You're frustrated. You're thirsty. And I want to tell you this. This is a conversation my wife and I had when we first started dating. 
if you ever want to get from point A to point B in your life, if you ever want to see whatever happened, you're going to have to do work. And here's what life does. A lot of times, you know, you do work, you put your foot out there, you put your heart out there, you trust somebody with your heart in relationships or whatever, or, or, or you try to do things that you feel like the Lord has called you to do. You try to do these things, and sometimes it fails. Y'all feeling me? Yeah. Anybody ever been hurt by somebody? Anybody ever done something that failed? Absolutely, man. Every single one of us has. But here's the thing. If you want to see success, if you want to experience the fullness of God in your life, if you want to go from point A to point B, if you want to leave the desert, if you want to see the glory and the peace and the joy in your life that is promised for Christians who love and trust the Lord because He has come to give us life, eternity, and Amen. life to the fullest, even now, if you want to see that thing, even when you're tired, keep digging, keep pressing, because I'm telling you, if you keep doing it when it matters the most, even when you're tired, there is an incredible thing that is always waiting just around the corner but if you ditch out if you drop your shovel you say I'm done with this then you might not see what's coming down the future does that make sense yeah. failing doesn't make you a failure staying down does Thomas Edison I love this quote national treasure but um, he uh, he was asked uh, I think he, it was about 2,000 ways he tried to make a light bulb and it never worked he finally made a light bulb that worked. And they asked him, they said, well, you know, I mean, how's it been, you know, making, I mean, failing 2,000 times? He said, I didn't fail. I found 2,000 ways not to make a light bulb. <laughs> and I found the right way to make the right one. But guess what? 2,000 times, the dude stumbled. But he kept going, kept pressing. And that's the same with any accomplishment story in life. you got to keep moving. you got to keep pressing. So... I say all that to ask you guys this tonight. I know we're getting out a little late, but this is really important, and I want us to have a minute to do this. Because this is, this, is, this is really important. I want to ask you this tonight. What is God calling you to do? Do you need to get back into His Word? You know, maybe you came to camp in February, you were all pumped up, but you haven't really read His Word hardly much since. Do you need to get into the Word more? Do you need to build a prayer life? Do you need to trust Him with some things in your life? Some things are going tough and you need to trust Him with family or friends or jobs even? Loneliness? What is it? What's God calling you to do? What's He calling you to do? What's that tough thing that's just frustrating and you're thirsty for God to give you an answer on? And what's keeping you from putting your shovel to the dirt? What's keeping you from going, you know what, Lord, I know you're calling me to reach these people in my life, but what's your excuse? What is it? What's keeping you from doing that? I want us to take a couple minutes tonight. I want you to ask yourself. Close your eyes if you guys would, but not just so that we don't have any instructions. I want you to ask yourself, what is God calling me to do? Is it to let go of something or to start doing something? Start reaching someone? And I want to ask you, what's keeping you from putting the shovel to the dirt? What's keeping you from digging those ditches, trusting in the Lord fully, doing what He calls you to do? Remember, there's an incredible thing waiting to happen if you're faithful now. So I want you to ask yourself that. And we're going to take a few minutes and just respond worship.